some magic work here. The energy of life is what makes all things grow and expand. And when we think of healing, those of us who have some experience with being healers or with being healed, we may think in complex terms, what does it take to learn to be a healer? I'd like to tell you very simply how you can learn to be a healer. Healing is life at work. Anything that makes a person more alive causes healing within them. Do you know how simple that is? If you smile at somebody and you cause them to smile back, you have raised the level of life force in that person. Just that simply. Give somebody a compliment and watch their body language. Their body straightens up, their shoulders go back. They're more alive than they were before the compliment. You notice something beautiful about them, say so, and you're a healer. That's the simple truth. Now, the simple truth about the other side of life is when you gossip about somebody, you're doing it for the purpose of making them less alive. <clears throat> I got choked up on that one. You're doing it for the purpose of making them less alive. Think about it. That's the reason for gossip and for criticism. We call it putting people down. Putting people down is our attempt to assassinate people. We have in our hands as human beings the power of life and the power of death. We can make someone more alive or we can make them less alive by our relationship with them. And when we learn that, when we find out how powerful we are as human beings, then we start using our potential to empower people and we learn that we don't need to disempower people if we can empower ourselves. Now, those are the simple things that I'm going to tell you. You have the power of life in your hands, in your face, in your body, in your thoughts. You can project your thoughts to affect another person. And if you add a facial expression with that projection of thoughts, you can do this now if you like makes me feel better. You want to make me more alive? Yes. Put it on your face. Okay, I feel better already. See, you're healers, all of you. That's all we have to do to heal people, and that's literally the truth. You want to heal somebody? Listen, when you go to the hospital and you go in a hospital room, I'm speaking from experience. I want to let you know this. I had a devastating illness a little over five years ago. And some people came to see me in the hospital. And fortunately, my close family, my son, who's here, and the associates who work with me, when they came to the hospital, they came radiating and telling me how wonderfully the fellowship was doing without me. <laughs> well, part of that didn't make me feel so good, but the rest of it made me feel wonderful. They always came in joyous and smiling, they didn't come in looking like what the doctors had told them. The doctors had told them, he's not going to live. Make sure he's prepared to die. That's what the doctors had said to them. And unfortunately, there was one lady who cared for me a lot, who heard that and was affected by it. When she came in the room with that on her face, my energy went right down. She came in with tears. Her face said, I know you're dying. And there's just one good thing about that for me. When somebody tells me I'm going to die, it gets me riled up. So I just decided, by God, I'm not going to do it. And that helped. That can help too. But remember, I said, by God. It helps to use that phrase once in a while. Don't consider it swearing. I can, by God, do this. So use it in your language. Just remember, it's sacred. You're calling his name. I can, by God, make you feel better. 
And how do we do it by God? How do we get God involved in this process? I've said there are only two energies, two forces, life and death. And we can enliven people by smiling, by bringing joy, by giving a compliment, by touching them. And I'm going to speak about the healing touch in a little more detail in just a moment. With our facial expression, with our words, and with our touch, we can make people more alive. You have that power. You have that power particularly over yourself. And if you're willing to take your power for yourself, you can make yourself more alive. Now, you can make others more alive because others want your love and your caring. And when they get it, what they get from you is life. So just remember, remember yourself as a giver of life and a person who can disempower life if other people are victims. Now, what, what you need to learn is you don't have to be a victim. So you don't have to let anyone take away your life. So when people try, that's when you need to empower yourself, make yourself more alive. So there is self-healing, and there is healing of others. How do I heal myself? You heal yourself with laughter and love and relaxation. Those three things will heal anything. I don't think there are any exceptions. They tell us in this day and time that AIDS is an exception, but I doubt it. I don't believe there's anything that God can't heal. Now, I've believed that for a long time, ever since I was a child. But you know, we can believe something and yet not quite know that it's true until we have the experience. So I had the experience for myself. I had to get well. I had an illness. I've had this experience. And I'm telling you this because I want you to know that what I know about healing, I know experientially because it happened to me. And it happened to me in several different ways, in several different steps. I needed this truth that I already knew to be illustrated and to come to life and to be experiential. <coughs> Learning is experiential, you know. So I can hear that love heals, and it does. Now I've brought in another word, so I better explain explain the relationship. I said there's an energy called life and an energy called death. Those energies also have another word, each of them. And I want to give you the other two terms that they're associated with because we might understand them a little bit better by using these modern terms. There is love. That's also life. They're the same thing, synonymous terms. If I love you, I life you. What that means is, I, if I love you, I give you more life. I increase life in you by giving you my love. Now that's provable. I'll tell you how we proved it shortly. If I love you, I give you more life. If I fear, I make myself less alive. If I cause fear in you, I make you less alive. So we've got two energies to work with. <clears throat> we can call the energies life and death. We can call them love and fear. Love and fear are opposites. But then the question comes up, what about a child? When a child is sick, surely a mother's love is the most potent love in the universe. Why doesn't a mother's love always heal a sick child? The answer to that is, when children get really seriously ill, mothers get scared. That's important for you to know, isn't it? The energy of fear takes away the energy of love. Don't get scared when you get ill. Now that applies in another way. You know what happens when you get something called <clears throat> a diagnosis? That lets you know what you have. Actually, it doesn't. It lets you know what has you. And if it has you, you're in trouble. If you have it, 
it gets simple. Drop it. But if it has you, it's a little more difficult. If it has you, what you have to do is get over it. Isn't that interesting how we use language? <laughs> I have to get over it if it has me. Now, if I have it, I can just drop it. But if it has me, I have to get over it. Getting over it means when you have found out, you've got your diagnosis now. The doctor says you've got arthritis. Now, all that did for you was give you a name to call it. But now that you have this name, it's yours. And you have your arthritis for the rest of your life. Here it is, my arthritis. And that's what I call it, don't I? My arthritis. So you come up to me and you said, I would like to heal, I would like you to heal my arthritis. I'm sorry, honey, I can't unless you give it to me. You're going to have to make it my arthritis, then I'll drop it. As long as it's your arthritis, I can't heal it. I can't help you. I will try to lift your spirits. That'll make you more alive. I will love you with all my heart. And I know how to do that. I had real special training in that. Let me tell you what happened to me. While I was ill with this devastating illness, the doctors had told me that they made a mistake. I had a simple bowel obstruction. It was probably gas, but it hurt. So they took me off to the hospital, and the doctor thought he has ulcers. I knew I didn't have ulcers, but that didn't stop him from cutting. So he started cutting, and he made a slip, and he cut open the pancreas. And the pancreas is surrounded in an envelope that protects it. And once that envelope is, is cut, the pancreas comes through, and you've got a destroyed organ. So they said, your organ will never work again. Your pancreas is completely destroyed, full of scar tissue. You'll have to live on insulin the rest of your life. And all of these other things, I had this big bag of medicine that I carried with me everywhere I went. Big shoulder bag, big red bag. And um, I was carrying that thing around, trying to be as alive as I could be without a pancreas. And you know, during that time of convalescence, I, I did a little bit of reading. And in one of, the, one of the things that I picked up to read, I read of a lady who was in a nice, comfortable position with, uh, with a nice girl's school in India. But in her position, as she became principal of this fancy girl's school, she was put in a room up high on the wall that overlooked a street in Calcutta. And she looked down and saw these children playing in the sewer, the open sewer that ran through the street. And she gave up all she had to go down there and live with these children. And when I read about this woman that had given her whole life for the poorest of the poor, I said, they tell me I'm dying, but before I die, I want to go to Calcutta, and I want to experience working with Mother Teresa. And I, I can't share the entire story with you tonight, but I want to share these things. When I got to uh, Frankfurt, Germany, on the way to India, someone mistook my medicine bag for a purse and <laughs> stole it. It was stolen. Insulin was gone, the medicine was gone, and a doctor was traveling with me because, you know, all my family and the people around me were all worried about me trying to go over to India in my condition. And everyone was convinced I wouldn't make it back. And my wife was quite resigned to that. You know, there were people who told her uh, he'll never come back, and she said, there's no point in telling him that. He'll go anyway. So my wife accepted it, and the people around me were supportive, but they did send a doctor with me. So in Frankfurt, all the medicine was stolen, and the doctor said, we have to go back home. And I said, no way. I haven't gotten to Calcutta yet, and I'm going. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to get well. <laughs> I mean, what other choice do we have? The medicine's gone. So we got on the plane. We flew to Calcutta, and, uh, and the doctor, being worried, It's not for me, is it? 
the doctor. The doctor. Oh, it, th that was the doctor. Okay. Doctors do get worried. They think that helps. You know what worry is, don't you? Uh, you better take one of my other classes if you don't know what wor worry is. I'll tell you more about it, but for now, I'll just tell you one thing. Worry is meditation. Backwards. <laughs> See, worry is negative meditation. And for those of you who would tell me, I've tried all kinds of meditation techniques and nothing works for me. I've tried mantras, I've tried visualization, I've tried uncomfortable positions with my legs, nothing works. I only want to ask you one thing, can you worry? If you can worry, you can meditate. You've already learned how, all you have to do now is worry backwards. That's meditation and it works. See, just worry backwards. And what that means is worry that things will get so good that you won't be able to handle them. <laughs> See, you can worry yourself to death about your health. Maybe I need to say that again. You can worry yourself to death about your health. And you can worry yourself to life if you learn to worry backwards, and that's called meditation. And that's all there is to it. You don't need any more classes, just worry backwards. <laughs> so this doctor was worrying, so he went down and in India, he found some pork insulin and injected that into me and I had a violent reaction. It wasn't pork insulin that I needed. As a matter of fact, I didn't need any insulin by then. My pancreas was just fine and I knew it. So I went to work and I was assigned to work in the home for the destitute dying. Now I had learned many years before that the energy that heals is love. I knew it because of the work of Dr. Dolores Krieger. I'll always be thankful to that woman for the work that she did. Do you know the name? Yes. Dolores Krieger was professor of nursing at New York, uh, New York University. And she did her doctoral thesis on laying out of hands healing. That's pretty unusual in itself, isn't it? That she would even take such a subject and do an academic treatise on it. That in itself is wonderful to me. But she tested to see if it could actually make a difference to have her nurses put their hands on patients for the purpose of healing. And she drew blood samples from the patients and she found that there was elevated oxygen and hemoglobin in the blood. Both of those indicators that healing had been stimulated. So it did work, but it didn't work every time. So she divided her nurses into control groups to see what makes this work. What's the working factor, the X factor in this healing by touch? She tested to see if nurses who were strong, vital, powerful people could do it better. They couldn't. She tested to see if religious nurses could do it better. They couldn't, thank God. <laughs> she tested to see if nurses who believed in it could do it better. They couldn't. That surprised you, didn't it? That wasn't the X factor. And as she had gone through all of these factors to test what might be the X factor in healing by touch, she sat it at her desk thinking and trying to think of one more factor to test. She had run out of X factors. And you know, this is a good technique for getting an answer, by the way. She wasn't worrying. She was sitting at her desk, opening her mind to getting an answer and as she was listening, maybe she was asking God to speak to her. I don't know, she never told me this. But if she was, it worked. Not that she got this voice out of heaven that spoke to her, but that's not the way God talks. You need to learn how God communicates with you. This is the way it happened for Dr. Krieger. A student nurse came into her office as she was wondering, what is this factor? I need to find this factor. Student nurse walked into her office and said, Dr. Krieger, I really hope this works for Mrs. So-and-so. I really care about her. Light went off. 
So Dr. Krieger tested to see if when a nurse had a special relationship with a particular patient, is that the factor? It was. The X factor was love. Real love, real caring, not worry. You know, you have been taught that good parents worry. Forget it. Worry is negative meditation. You don't want to be imagining all kinds of awful things happening to your children, so don't worry. It has power. It has power enough to kill you. So don't disempower yourself with worry. I knew about this experiment when I went to India. I knew that love could heal. And I knew that love was the power that was healing me. I felt the love of the people who cared about me from all over the world. And do you know what I learned being in the hospital? I learned how much easier it is to love than to be loved. I already knew I can love anybody. I had loved people all over the world. And when I wound up in a hospital bed with all of these people sending me love from all over the world, I just didn't know how to handle it. There was this little boy in London that I had never seen. I didn't know him. But he had come to our fellowship office in London with his little piggy bank. And he said, I want to send this to Paul Solomon to help pay his hospital bill. They mailed it to me and I cried because I didn't know how to handle receiving love. And that's why I needed to be in the hospital. I needed to learn to receive as well as to give. So I learned how hard it is to let people love you and just receive it and let that make you well. So I knew that love could heal, but I needed the experience of seeing it at work. So here I was in Calcutta at the home for the destitute dying. And the first thing that I learned in that place was I thought, you know, Mother Teresa gets money from all over the world. I thought I was going to a well-equipped clinic. And I had some medical training, medical background. I knew how to start an IV. I knew all of, I had nurses training. I was a medic in the army. So here I was prepared to give antibiotics and pain medication and so on walked into the place and I found that we didn't even have towels to work with, not even a cloth to wash things with. We were using pieces of palm fronds, you know that, that stuff? Using that to wash dishes, dipped it in wood ashes, there was no soap, except the soap that we brought from hotels, the volunteers that were working there brought these little bars of soap so that we could wash the patients. When I got there, <clears throat> Everybody was too busy to tell us what to do. So I tried to stop a sister and say, what do I do? What do you need? And she just sort of pushed me aside and said, I'm busy. You get to work. I didn't know what to do, but I did see a bedpan that needed emptying. I didn't know where to empty it, so I picked the thing up and I, I started to ask somebody, where do I wash this thing out? And again, somebody pushed me to the one side and said, I'm busy. You know, get to work. So I learned real quick that you, you learn your way around in this place and there's not much to work with. And when I went back to empty this bedpan, I found no running water and no soap and no towels. And you know, I was, I was sort of stunned by the whole atmosphere. And the place is open to the air. Do you know how hard it is to breathe in Calcutta? People walk around with handkerchiefs over their face so they can breathe the dust in the air. It's heavy, it's dark, you can hardly even see, much less breathe. And the heat, overpowering. So I was pouring with sweat and picking up men off their beds and carrying them back to this little basin of water to give them their baths every morning. I mean, um, Sister Luke is, is not your sweetness and light nun. She's a top sergeant. And she doesn't allow bed baths. So we couldn't bring a nice basin of water and wash these dying men in bed. We had to pick them up in our arms, carry them back, set them up on a piece of concrete, and hold them while we bathed them from head to toe, and then change them into clean pajamas. So that's what we were doing. I mean, it was tough physical work. 
and I was supposed to be sick. Except I couldn't afford to be, thank God. I couldn't afford to be sick. I didn't have time to be sick. I saw these people, and I learned real quick, you've only got one thing to work with here, and this is what they told us. When we went in, they said, look, you need to understand, you have medical training, we know that. You're not here to heal these people. This is a place where you allow people to die with dignity and with love. And that sort of took my breath away. We're not here to make them well. We're here to allow them to die with dignity and love. And what I heard from that is the only instrument that you have for healing in this place is love. Hypodermic needles. Well, we had this child named Bola, seven years old. He had tuberculosis and he had hepatitis B, very infectious. They were telling us, be careful that he doesn't breathe in your face. But then Bola was laying on this concrete bunker on a little mat and his little bones, his, his body looked like a Holocaust victim and he was unconscious. And we needed to get an IV into his arm to get some moisture into his system. He was dehydrated. And they brought these enormous needles and these, these tiny little arms. The needle was almost as big as the arm. And I thought, what am I going to do? There was no way to, to get into a vein in Bola's arm. And so we were trying to find some way to get some fluid started. And I didn't know what to do but pray. So I asked, I said, God, what do we do? And the first thing that came to me was, the insulin is gone, but the insulin needles were packed in a different bag. And I had these tiny little microfine insulin needles, and I got those tiny little needles, and I got into Bola's vein. And I thought, you know, this is the way miracles happen. We started this drip IV going into his arm, and then I'm looking at his body laying on this mat, and I'm thinking, this has got to be so uncomfortable for this child. So I picked him up in my arms, and I'm holding him. And holding him, I'm saying, God, teach me to love. That's what I'm here to learn. Teach me to love enough to heal this little boy. Sorry, I'm reliving the experience. Didn't intend to do that. <clears throat> I'm okay. My tears started to fall on this child, and Sister Luke came over immediately, and she said, I don't think you're meant to work here. And I said, Sister Luke, don't worry about me. These are healing tears. And she understood immediately, and do you know what she did? She got down on her knees immediately and kissed my feet. When she understood these are healing tears, something clicked for her, and she just went right down to her knees and kissed my feet. And Bola woke up. His eyes came open. He was conscious. So then we started feeding him some mashed banana and some sugar to get something into his system so he became conscious. And you know, as we worked with this child, he, his sense of humor came alive. Can you imagine that? He thought it was funny that a man would hold him in his arms. That's unheard of in India. I mean, the children are raised by the women. And when a nurse held him, that was all right, one of the ladies. But here he was in a man's arms, and he laughed. He thought that was funny. And so we passed him from man to man. As our arms grew too tired to hold him, we passed him from one person to another. But then we learned something else. A man came on in off the street. And I had been seeing these people on the sidewalks of Calcutta. And I was really inside. You know, love is not supposed to cause you pain. But I hadn't learned that yet. 
and I was still experiencing pain for these people on the street corners of Calcutta who took their baths on the street corner because that's where the hydrant was. There was no running water. So everybody lines up. The men are shaving one another on the sidewalk, and people are taking a bath on the street corner. And so many people had nowhere to go, no place to live, and no way to even wash. A man came into the home for the destitute dying. He had a huge gash on his leg, and it was infected. And our job was to wash him. I was with a young Japanese man who was the very, I mean, he was love alive. He was just a bundle of living love. He was willing to do anything that he had to do for these people in this home for the destitute dying. And so I grabbed him and I said, you know, we couldn't speak the same language. We didn't speak the language of the patients. And he and I didn't speak, I didn't speak Japanese, he didn't speak English. But we understood one another enough to work together. We took this man back and we took his clothes and began to wash him. And he had on this little loincloth, this, this little sort of twisted handkerchief that they wear. And he wouldn't let us remove the loincloth. And I thought, well, that's modesty. But the thing was filthy. And as we washed this man, his body was covered with coal dust. And as we're trying to wash this black, oily stuff off of this gash in his flesh, we're trying to be gentle, trying to get this clean. And we washed, and we washed, and the water ran black as we got this soot off his body. That must have been there for who knows how long. This homeless man who had nothing and no one. And that's what we were learning about these people. Nobody loved them. And that's what they felt. And as we gave this man a bath and came down to that last little bit, that loincloth had to come off. And the Japanese fellow looked at me. And from the way he looked at me, I knew what he was going to do. He didn't have to say anything. We weren't speaking the same language. So I took the man's hands and held him while he yanked the loincloth. And it came off, and you know what happened? This man had his treasures rolled up in that little piece of cloth. It's all he owned in the world. There were a couple of stones in there, and there were some washers off bolts because they looked like coins. They weren't worth anything, but to him, it was all he had. That was his bank. And there were a couple of real coins and one piece of paper money. It was a 10 rupee. And 10 rupees is worth about five cents, maybe. And that was the most money that he had. And as his treasures went all over the floor, we understood it wasn't modesty. But that's where he kept his treasure. And as we took off the loincloth and all his treasures went all over the floor, I immediately went down to gather up these things and to try to communicate with him without language. I understand these are important to you. We got a clean cloth to put them in and we wrapped them up and handed them to him. And then is when I got my lesson. You know what that man did? He picked up that 10 rupee note and tried to give it to me. And again, I was in tears. And I said to my friend who was working with me, who's the patient here? Who's teaching love to whom? I was learning love from these patients who were caring for each other. They would get us and steer us in the direction of somebody who needed help. They were looking after each other. And the atmosphere of love in that place was such that these people came there to die with dignity. But I watched them walk out, alive and well, healed by nothing but love, because that's all we had to heal with. And that is enough. It's enough to heal you. It's enough to heal me. Love is life. When Moses ask God his name. God responded with, I am life. And then when John wrote a little bit later, he said, God is love. And 
God is life. And he wrote, to the extent that any of you has life, it's because God is alive in you. So we learn that the terms are synonymous. Life, love, God, light. Enlightenment is God in you. To the extent that you're aware, it's because God is alive in you. And that's living love. And to the extent that you love, it's because God is in you, because God is love. And do you know what that means? If I love you, I God you. What if we just stopped using that word that people have distorted with romantic connotations and stop saying I love you and start saying I God you? What would happen if we start guarding each other? We make one another more alive. That's what this is about tonight. This is what this healing service is about. I want to God you. And I want you to have the opportunity to God anyone here who needs healing. I want to tell you one last experience that was the moment of healing for me in India. And I want you to know this because of the gift that we can give to one another. The greatest gift that I ever received in my life came from a man who had died on the street in Calcutta. I didn't know him until he came in after his death. But when he was brought in, Sister Luke didn't allow the volunteers to take care of the dead. She washed them and prepared them herself. And one thing that I want you to know is Mother Teresa is not in Calcutta to make Catholics out of Muslims. If they're Muslim, they get a Muslim burial. And they get encouragement to worship in their religion. And that's one of the reasons I went there. This woman knows that God is not in a square brown box labeled Catholic. And I knew that God was not in a square brown box labeled Baptist anymore. I let him out of the box. And I found that he was too big to fit in it again. And I found that instead of blaming me, he loved me. Especially when I needed it. And you know, I don't know if you believe in reincarnation or not. It's not particularly important. You don't have to believe in it at all. You'll come back anyway. <laughs> but this lady told me, she said, there's something so sad in your face. And I said, listen, lady, I don't want to hear that. I'm a happy person, and I've been joyous for most of my life. I spent the first half of my life being sad, but I'm joyous now, and I don't want you to see sadness in my face. And she said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, you misunderstand. She said, there's a sadness in you that comes from way back, way back when you wanted and she stopped and she thought for a minute. She said, you were alive when Jesus was on earth. But you never saw him and you never touched him. But you, you served him after he was gone. And she said, ever since then, your soul has wanted to touch the Christ. And she said, she said, you know, this can't make sense. But the message that I'm getting is, you're going to have the opportunity to touch the body of the Christ in this lifetime. And I thought, yes, that does sound a little peculiar. How's that going to happen? I mean, one of the inspirational verses of the Bible to me was when Job wrote, I am convinced that in my flesh I shall see God. And every time I read that verse, I got this lift from it because I wanted to say that for myself. I am convinced that in my flesh I shall see God. And so that was my favorite Bible verse. And when she said this, it reminded me, that's my favorite verse. And something rang true about it. She had hit the nail on the head. But there I was one day in that home for destitute dying. Sister Luke was gone. 
ambulance pulled up and they had brought in a man who had died on the street. Now she always took care of that, but she was gone. So the young Japanese man and I looked at each other and we nodded our head and we agreed, we'll do it. And we took him back in the room where they prepared the bodies. We knew that he was Muslim. I didn't know how to prepare him for a Muslim burial, but I did know, I thought, how to wash with tenderness and with love. And the Japanese man and I held hands and meditated for a moment. And what I was thinking, and I'm sure he was thinking what I was thinking, I knew it. Even though we couldn't speak, our minds were in the same place. And I was saying to this man who had died, it looks like maybe nobody ever loved you while you were alive. But if you can be aware of us now, we want you to know somebody loves you now. And with that thought, we began to wash his body. And the love in the room was so alive. And as we're washing and not quite knowing what we're doing or how to do it, Sister Luke, the top sergeant, burst into the room and she said, do you know what you're doing? And it scared us both. We stepped back and we said, no, we don't know what we're doing. <coughs> and she looked at us with this tender look that was not characteristic of Sister Luke. And she said, Mother Teresa's favorite Bible verse is, as you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. She said, you're washing the body of the master. And that verse came back. In my flesh, I shall see God. And I was touching this body, and it was a Muslim man. He wasn't even Christian, but it was Jesus. I, to me, the experience was that real, that alive. And I thanked this man that I had never known in his life for, in his death, giving me the experience of being with the Master and having the opportunity to touch him. And maybe then I understood for the first time what that verse meant. As you've done it to one of the least of these, not just symbolically, but really you've done it to me. If I can touch you and give you all the love that is in me, I've touched the master. I know who you are. I know, as I look into your eyes, I know God is in there. That's why you're alive. And I want to share God with you. I want to share love with you. I want to give you my love. And I want to give you the opportunity to love every person who comes up here for healing tonight. That's what these healing services are about. It's your opportunity to love. It's your opportunity to fulfill that verse and to understand. And as much as you've done it to any one of these, you've done it to the Christ, to the Master, to God himself, not symbolically, but really. Heal one of his children. And you've given healing, you've given love to God. This is your opportunity to experience what Job was talking about. I'm convinced in my flesh I shall see God. You know, the fundamentalist Christians like to say, believe in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And I grew up with that teaching and I wondered as I moved beyond my hard shell, Baptist, God in a box days, I wondered, what does that really mean? Believe in the Lord. Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and then as I visited Jerusalem and looked at Golgotha this place that's in the shape of a skull I realized that 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 shape of the skull 
is something that I encounter every day in every pair of eyes that I meet. There are those caves where the Christ is buried. Believe in the Christ. If I'm going to believe in the Christ consistently, I have to believe in him in you. When I look into your eyes, I look for him. And if I love you enough, life comes out of you, and that's the resurrection. And as you come to life because you're loved, then comes that wonderful moment when power in you, when healing in you comes alive and says, I am the resurrection and the life. That's not a 2,000 year old story. That's for us now, tonight. If I can believe in the Christ in you, and if I ever make an exception, if I ever find a pair of eyes when I say, I don't believe God's in there, then I haven't believed in him. And I won't find him in that person. There are a lot of people who haven't been loved for a long time. And the Christ in them is well hidden back in the tomb. And all it takes to call him forth is to create a space of love that lets people let the love that is in them come out. Everyone wants to love. Even the people who hide it most. Even the people who are hurting most. Even the people who are most <laughs> macho and don't want to show love. There's a being in there. There's a child of God in there. And there's a need to be loved. And those people, I got to tell you this, just a couple of months ago, I was in Toronto, Canada, and we did a healing service. And this man that was about so tall, you know, as he came up in the healing line and I was going to touch him, I had to stand on my tiptoes to touch his forehead. That guy was that big. But when I went to touch him, he threw his arms around me and he started to squeeze. And as he was squeezing me and I was holding him and hugging him, I, I thought, this man is really needing love. And then I thought, God, how can I meet his need? And you know what came into my mind? Be his mommy. He's not hugging you. He's hugging his mommy. And I knew he was. I was just being a substitute for his mother. And this man, seven feet tall, hadn't been hugged since he was in diapers. And he needed it. Now, that's what this healing service is about. I want to hug you. And I want to love you. And... I want all of you out there to allow me to be your arms for a moment. As people need healing and come up here, we're going to allow them to come up here so that I can be with them for a moment. Now, I'm not going to heal them, but I want you to. I want you to love each person that comes up here enough for them to let go completely let go of the stress that holds us up tight. Let go of the stress that gets embodied and keeps our dis-ease inside. Let go. If you and I can love enough to get people to let go, they will let go of their disease. What do you need healing for? Maybe it's a physical illness. If so, that's easy. But let me tell you something about physical illness. When you come up here and we're all singing, and we will be, we're going to sing to you. And we're going to hug you. And I'm going to touch you. And there's something that happens sometimes. It may happen to you, it may not. But if it does, don't stop it. What may happen is when I touch you, you may feel a sense of letting go and you get a little dizzy and you start to fall. If you do, 
there's going to be a strong young man standing right behind you. When you fall, just fall into some loving arms. And he will lay you gently down on the floor and stay there as long as you need to. And if there are tears that have been needing to be cried ever since you were so high that you didn't finish crying when you were a kid, let them come. It's all right to be emotional when you're releasing your illness. So it's okay to cry. And something else that I found out just a couple of weeks ago in Dallas, it's also all right to laugh. There was a lady who came up in the healing line and I touched her and she fell. And as she went down to the floor, she broke out into hysterical laughter. And she told me later how embarrassing it was for her, just pouring out this hysterical laughter. And she tried to stop because her mouth was wide open and she thought, people can see my dentures. <laughs> and so she wanted to stop the laughter and close her mouth. And she finally got the laughter to stop. And she sat up thinking, OK, I'm in control now. And it started again, pouring out. And all of this laughter needed to come out. It was turning loose and turning loose and turning loose of years of stress and tension that had become embodied. That's what dis-ease is. We know now that you can't think without moving muscles. It's a recent discovery, but it's now scientific fact. It's no longer just metaphysics. We're not talking about superstition. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about scientific fact. You can't think without moving muscles. And every stress thought that you think is a muscular contraction. And that contraction doesn't turn loose until you laugh or cry or get profoundly relaxed. Now, when was the last time you were profoundly relaxed? Probably about three months old. You thought you relaxed last night. Did you ever watch someone sleeping? You see all these movements trying to turn loose of stress and people grind their teeth all night. 40 pounds of pressure. Have you heard people grinding their teeth in their sleep? No. You know how long it's been since we were totally, profoundly relaxed? It's the last time that you had totally given up all of your concerns to your source. Let go and let God, it's called. So all I want you to do, if you want to turn loose of your dis-ease, if it's physical, that's fine. When I touch you, if you feel yourself falling, don't jerk back because you don't want it back. And after you fall and you wake up a little while later, you may go unconscious. It's all right. Don't get scared. There's nothing frightening about this experience. It's just love. When you let go, and when you sit up, don't go looking for the disease to see if you've still got it. <laughs> I don't want you to find it again. When you let go, let go and just expect that it's not going to be there tomorrow. What I'd like for you to think about right now is, what will it feel like to wake up tomorrow knowing that you don't have what you had yesterday? Are you through with it? Have you gotten all you can get out of the experience of being sick? If you are, you're through. When you're through with your disease, you make a healer look good. When you're through with it, you'll turn loose of it. Now, have you gotten everything that you could have gotten out of your illness, whatever it is? If so, here's the way you need to turn loose of it. Remember this. Be grateful in all things, for all things, at all times. Now what that means is, if you can be grateful for the experience of your illness and the opportunity to turn loose of it now, then you're finished with it. Can you thank God for the experience that you've been through, however painful it was? If you can be grateful now, then you're through with it. Receive your wonderful experiences and your painful experiences with the same attitude of gratitude. 
and you'll take the pain out and make your learning experience a beautiful experience. Gratitude will allow you to turn loose and be through with whatever it is. You need healing physically. You need healing in relationships. You need healing with money, prosperity healing. You need to change your relationship with money so that it can flow to you, so that you can support the things that loving people of this planet need to support, so that you can support this place, this temple that we're in tonight. If places like this are serving you, then you need to be wealthy enough to support the work of God around the world. And if you have felt there's something desirable about poverty, just remember the people who taught you that are the people who have enough money that they want to hang on to it and make sure that nice spiritual people don't get hold of it. So let's not buy that stuff anymore. The people of this planet who should control the money of this planet are the ones who love. If the loving spiritual people of this planet had the money, a quarter of the world would not be starving. They're not hungry because this planet is not abundant. God is abundant. But a quarter of this world, a quarter of the people on this planet are hungry tonight because it's the arms manufacturers that have the money. They don't think it's nice and spiritual to live in poverty. If that's what you thought, I'd like to heal you of that tonight so that you know it's all right tomorrow for you to let income come to you. It's all right for you to have money. It is all right for you to want abundance, to experience abundance. It's all right for the spiritual people of this planet to have the control of the financial wealth of this planet so that we can feed the people that need to be fed. We've got to heal this illness called poverty. So if that's your illness, let yourself be healed of that tonight. If you have disease in relationships, disease with your prosperity, disease with your self-worth, disease in your physical body, your emotions, your mind, whatever it is, whatever kind of lack of ease you're experiencing, God can heal whatever is making you uncomfortable. So I'm going to ask you to do something. When you come up here, I'm going to ask you to give it to me. Now you can give it up to God if you want to. The only reason that I say give it to me is because I'm standing here. You can see me and touch me physically. Giving it up to God may be like giving it up to a concept. So what you can do is give it to me. I'm not afraid of it. You got cancer you want to get rid of? I'll take it. I know what it is. It's concentrated energy. It took a lot of vitality to make that cancer. And I need energy, so let me have it. I'll just reinterpret it. So I'm not afraid of your illness. I'm not afraid of your disease. Give it to me. When I touch you, let me have it. You turn loose, let go. If you fall, we'll have a nice, wonderful, strong set of arms to catch you. And you release until you're finished with it. And when you're through, go out of here knowing that you are loved, knowing that it is all right for you to have abundance in your life, knowing that you have been healed and that the healing will continue until you are strong, alive, and feel good about yourself and about your relationship with your source and your relationship with others. That's whole healing, total healing. Now, if it takes a few days, it's all right. If you want to let it go in an instant, that's all right. If that's not believable to you, if you believe it needs to take a week, that's okay. Take a week. We'll just start the process now. Take as long as you need to finish it. But know that everybody here is here because they care. 
So allow yourself to feel loved. And when you come up and hug me, if you need to, me to be mommy, it's okay, I don't mind. Just hug your mommy, I'll stand in for her. <laughs>